If you love a good murder mystery, then you are going to love June's Journey, the hidden object murder mystery game where you'll awaken your inner sleuth and step right into the thrilling adventure set in the heart of the roaring 20s. Search for hidden objects and collect clues to solve the mystery. And with endless hours of fun, there's thousands of intricate scenes and new chapters every week. Download June's Journey for free today on the Apple Store or Google Play. Again, that's just June's Journey on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video here today. Today is a wild, wild solved case. Let me know in the comments below if you guys enjoy listening to solved cases or unsolved cases better. Obviously, regardless, we're going to have a good mix here on this channel as we always do. But I am curious because I get a lot of different comments on whether or not you prefer solved cases versus unsolved cases. But today we are talking about a solved case and we are talking about the case of 50 year old Beverly Carter. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. So this is Beverly Carter. Beverly Carter was born on December 20th, 1965 in Aniston, Alabama to her parents, John Brian Loans and Marlene Loans. Beverly also had two siblings. She has siblings named Kathy and Toby and Beverly married a man named Carl Carter. And the two of them actually met while Beverly was waitressing at a hamburger restaurant in Texas when Carl was 19 and Beverly was only 16 years old. Right off the bat, they started dating and shortly after that, they got married at City Hall. Now, after Beverly and Carl ended up getting married, they had three children together. They had three boys. They had Carl Carter Jr., Christopher Carter, and Chad Carter. Beverly's boys were her pride and joy. She absolutely loved being their mom and she was entering this new phase in her life where her children were having children. So she was now a grandmother and that was her everything. Her family was her absolute world. Her family describes her as having a beautiful smile and a laugh that would fill a room and that you could hear down the hall, along with being one of the most authentic and genuine people you would ever meet. Now, when it came to Beverly's marriage with Carl, not everything was always smooth sailing. As you can imagine, they met when Beverly was only 16 years old. So over the course of the years, there are bound to be some hardships and there definitely were. The two of them did struggle with some financial issues as well as Carl having an affair. However, despite both of these major issues, the two of them decided to stick it out and to stay together and they really worked through their issues and were coming out on the other side of them. And once they got to their 20 year wedding anniversary, they decided to celebrate because they didn't have the big wedding when they first got married and by their 20 year wedding anniversary, they really wanted something to kind of celebrate going into this new chapter together after putting everything aside. They wanted to kind of start fresh and celebrate this new phase of life that they were in. So they decided to have the big dream wedding and that is exactly what they did. Now, a few years after the 20th wedding celebration, Beverly embarked on a new passion of hers and this passion was real estate. Beverly ended up getting her real estate license and she absolutely soared in this profession. This profession was built for the type of personality that Beverly had. Beverly worked for the Cry Lake Real Estate Company located in Scott, Arkansas. And in 2013, Beverly was the top listing and selling agent in Southern Arkansas, selling over $12 million worth of property. She was said to be able to sell anything and her personality absolutely shined. She was the type of real estate agent and had the type of clientele that after someone worked with Beverly, they wanted to become her friend. She had clients where after she sold them a house, she would go to their weddings or go to their baby showers. She was just that connected to her client and her clients really felt and became her friends. Now let's talk about September 24th, 2014, because this day started out like any normal day in Scott. Arkansas. And it actually started out to be a really good day because Beverly actually won uh, in her office. They had like an office competition that they were running and Beverly actually won $50 in this office competition. So for all things considered, this was looking out to be a really, really great day. Now on September 24th, 2014, Beverly's last showing of the day was at six o'clock PM. And according to Beverly's family and friends, this was not a showing that she necessarily wanted to go to. It was 
was 6 o'clock p.m. It was the end of the day. She was tired. She really just wanted to go home. But the main incentive that she had in showing this property was that the client that she was going to meet at this home was willing to pay an all cash offer if they ended up wanting to purchase the home. Now, a little bit of real estate 101 is that when someone pays in all cash, you can close the deal a lot sooner and the sale goes through a lot quicker. So it's in the best interest of everyone, essentially, if it's an all cash offer. So that was her main incentive is that she knew if she could sell this house and close this deal, it would be an easy sale, it would be quick, and then she'd be done with it. So she called her husband, Carl, at about 5.30 p.m. on the 24th, telling him that she was about to leave to go over to the showing and that she would call him on her way home from the showing and that she would pick up dinner for the two of them and bring it back to the house. Beverly also gave Carl the address of the house that she was going to show, and this house was located on 14202 Old River Drive. Now, Carl didn't think anything of this. He thought it was a nice little update phone call. He was going to see Beverly when she got home, and that was that. However, when 9 o'clock p.m. rolled around and Beverly still didn't make it home, Carl started to get a little worried so he decided to drive over to the house that beverly was showing himself now the house wasn't too far away from where beverly and carl lived so he just got in his car and drove over and when he did he found beverly's car parked in the driveway with her purse still inside it and obviously that is not a good sign so carl ended up then walking inside of the house to see if beverly wasn't there he walked in he walked upstairs he walked downstairs but didn't find Beverly anywhere. Now this is when a little bit more panic started to set in and Carl decided to call his son Carl Jr. and ask if he had heard from Beverly. Now when Carl Jr. got on the phone and heard his dad's concerns, Carl Jr. thought it was very possible that Beverly was just working late on this particular night and he didn't think that anything was wrong. So because he didn't think that anything was wrong, he even offered to drive with his dad over to Beverly's real estate office just to prove to his dad like, hey, look, she's here. She's in her office. She's filling out paperwork. She was just working late. Don't worry about it. So Carl Jr. and Carl got in the car and drove over to Beverly's real estate office. However, when they got there, they saw that the office was completely closed, the doors were locked, the lights were off, and there was no one inside of it. And this is when the panic really started to set in. And that is when Carl then called police to file a missing persons report. Once the missing persons report was filed, authorities immediately showed up to the property that Beverly was showing and taped it off and labeled it as a crime scene since that is the last known place that Beverly was. Now, along with authorities, Carl and his son Carl Jr. were also at the property with authorities basically just watching them conduct the investigation. And at one o'clock in the morning, so now we're on the 25th of September at about 1 a.m., Carl received three text messages from Beverly. And along with that, around that same time, Beverly's two best friends, Brenda and Stacy, also received text messages from Beverly. And the reason that they received text messages from Beverly is because Carl had reached out to them, telling them that no one can find Beverly. Have you heard from Beverly? So they texted Beverly and Beverly responded to both of them. So Beverly has now texted Carl, her friend Brenda, and her other friend Stacy. Now, according to Brenda, the text that she received from Beverly said quote sorry my phone has been acting up what did you need end quote and this is when Brenda tried to send a signal to Beverly to see if everything was okay Brenda responded to Beverly by asking her if Beverly had put the red folder back on her desk now that might not mean anything to you and it really shouldn't however the signal that Brenda was sending Beverly in that text message was this now, from what I've learned since researching this entire case red folder is in real estate terms basically 911 red folder is the term that gets thrown out when something is wrong or if a real estate agent is in danger Brenda described it as if you got on the phone with a real estate agent while you're showing a property and said do you have the red folder from 645 
five Lakewood Street. That person on the other end of the line would know that you are in danger and to send you help. So red folder basically equals 911. So when Brenda asked Beverly, did you put the red folder back on my desk? She wasn't asking, did Beverly put a red folder back on her desk? She was waiting for Beverly to say either yes or no to indicate whether or not Beverly was truly in trouble. However, Beverly never responded back to that text message. Now, Beverly's other friend, Stacy, received a text from Beverly saying, quote, sorry, I'm out having drinks with friends, end quote. And Stacy thought that this was very, very odd. That was not a typical response from Beverly, meaning you know how your best friends text. I can sit here and tell you my best friends. I know each one of their texting styles, as would you with your closest friends and family. You know how they text. You know how they're going to respond to you. Whether that's they use a lot of emojis, little emojis, no emojis, they use exclamations, they abbreviate. These are just the things that you know. And when Stacy received that text from Beverly, she just knew that's not the type of way that Beverly would respond to something like that. And along with that, Stacy was also thrown off on the fact that Beverly said she was having drinks with friends because Stacy didn't know who else Beverly would be having drinks with. Stacy knew who Beverly's core group of friends were. Who was Beverly going out for drinks with at one o'clock in the morning? Now, when it came to the text that Beverly's husband, Carl, received, they were even more off-putting. Obviously, Carl had been texting Beverly prior saying, where are you? Are you okay? What's going on? And Beverly responded with three separate text messages. The first one said, yes, just yes, that's it. The second one said, sorry, phone's been dead. And the third said, having drinks now. This was not typical behavior for Beverly. She would have never gone out for drinks without calling Carl and telling him first. And not that there's even anything wrong with that. It was more so just the fact that Beverly had made set plans with Carl that she was going to drive home, pick up dinner, and meet him at the house. And if something were to change about that, she would have called him. However, she didn't. And those three texts alone were all Carl and Carl Jr. needed to know that something was very, very wrong with Beverly and that she was in danger. Carl Jr. said when he heard that Beverly had texted his dad, he felt this huge sigh of relief and felt completely okay. His mom's fine. She's texting his dad. Everything's going to be okay. But the second he saw what those text messages entailed, he knew that it was not his mom that was sending those texts. Now I want to talk about safety precautions for a second because I think we sometimes forget that a lot of people, not just the obvious ones, have jobs that put them in very vulnerable situations. And when we're talking about real estate agents, real estate agents have to go out and meet strangers at empty homes and that is just a very vulnerable position to be in, period. However you want to spin it, that is a very, very vulnerable position to put yourself in. However, Beverly always made sure that she went above and beyond on the safety precautions. She was always super, super cautious, and that went for this specific showing as well. Beverly's friends said that when it came to this particular showing, Beverly had told them about it and said that it was going to be a couple coming to the house, a husband and a wife, going to the house to see if they wanted to purchase it. Now, when setting up the appointment, Beverly said that the husband was the one who called to set up the appointment. However, Beverly wanted to make sure that his wife was also going to be at the appointment just to make sure that every everything was going to go okay and so Beverly wasn't meeting up with a strange man or a stranger who's a man at an empty home. So this even went to the extent of the husband putting the wife on the phone and Beverly speaking to the wife to confirm that she was going to be at the appointment to which Beverly's friends said that the wife did confirm that she would also be there. So Beverly was planning on meeting both the husband and the wife at the house. Along with that, this house was on a street that Beverly was very, very familiar with. This wasn't like she was going to an unknown location. This was a street that was very close to Beverly's and it also had people that she knew who lived on it, including her pastor. So this was a very familiar area for her. Now, when authorities initially began their investigation, one of the first things that they did is they started talking to neighbors of the property that Beverly was showing. And when authorities did this, they ended up speaking to one 
one neighbor in particular who said that at around the time of Beverly's disappearance, they looked outside of their window and saw a black car in the driveway of the property as well as a man. Now this man was described as a taller white man with short hair. So now police had somewhat of a description to go off of because they figured more than likely the person that this neighbor saw in the driveway was the person that Beverly was meeting with at the house. Now along with that, when authorities started searching through the property as well as searching through Beverly's car, they found Beverly's basically real estate folder in the passenger seat of her car, which included all of her listings and in particular, the listing that she was showing when she went missing. Now attached to this specific listing was a note and on this note had two names as well as an email address and a phone number and police assumed that these names and the email address and the phone number belonged to the people that Beverly met at the house that day. So obviously they took that information and ran it back and tried to track it. However, they quickly learned that the email address and the phone number were both fake. Now to switch gears for a moment, authorities also had someone else that they were looking at in this case. Not only were they trying to figure out who Beverly was meeting at the house that day, but they also had their eye on someone else and that would be Beverly's husband, Carl. Now obviously it's basically protocol at this point. When a husband or a wife goes missing, authorities look to the spouse to see if they had any possible involvement and that is exactly what they did with Carl. They brought him in for questioning and Carl was extremely extremely, extremely honest. Now, Carl even admitted that he wasn't surprised when authorities looked at him as a possible suspect. And you have to think about it this way. When authorities got the phone call to report Beverly as a missing person, Carl had not only already been to the crime scene, but he had already walked all through that house, leaving his DNA everywhere, which obviously to authorities contaminates the entire crime scene. And for people who are, you know, insightful in the true crime world, you listen to podcasts, you watch the videos, you know that the smartest thing to do at that time is to not go into a crime scene and to not contaminate it because you're gonna leave your DNA in there. However, you also have to understand that there are people who don't watch true crime videos and who don't listen to podcasts and who aren't educated in that, who think my wife went missing, she was last seen in this house, she's not answering her phone, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna check it out. There are a lot of people that do that not knowing the consequences to their actions once they do. However, on the flip side of that, we've also seen people who have said that exact same thing. I went into the house just to see she was there just to see if he was there they weren't answering their phone and turns out they were responsible for it and they were just using that excuse as a cover-up now either way authorities brought Carl in for questioning like I said and again he was very very honest. He told authorities that they did have some marital issues, including finance issues, because they had just taken out an $100,000 life insurance policy. Along with that, when authorities asked Carl if he had ever had an affair, he said, yes, he had had an affair, and that was the one that I told you about in the very beginning. And along with that, Carl also admitted to something else. Carl admitted to authorities that he had actually hit Beverly on one occasion and it was years and years and years and years and years ago. It was in the beginning years of them dating. None that that matters. You never do that. However, Carl said that the reason that this happened was because he and Beverly were driving in their car and Carl was driving and he was intoxicated. He was driving drunk and Beverly got mad at him and she told him to pull over, to stop the car, to stop driving and Carl responded by hitting her over the head and that is when Beverly Beverly made Carl pull the car over and she got out of the car and Carl drove off and drove himself into a ditch because he was too drunk to drive. Now, according to Carl, he said that Beverly completely forgave him for this because she knew that that was not Carl, that he was so intoxicated that that was not actually who he was and the two of them worked it out and talked it out and she eventually forgave him. But now what's interesting here is that Carl puts a target on his back by telling police, yes, we're having financial problems. We took out a $100,000 life insurance policy. Yes, I've had an affair. Yes, I've hit her before. You know, those three things in many, many cases that we've seen in the past, those three things are the target. Those three things are like, okay, there's your motive. However, authorities just knew that Carl was not responsible for this. They ran through all the possibilities. They ran through the possibility of him maybe hiring someone to get rid of Beverly. They ran through the possibilities of him doing it himself. However, over time and after talking to Carl, 
they just knew that he was not their guy for this. Now I want to switch gears again and go back to the phone number, email addresses, as well as the names on the note of the listing found in Beverly's real estate folder in her car that we had just talked about prior. Now, even though the phone number and the email addresses were both fake, authorities had enough substance from that note to go off of to run through everything on their database and they came back with two hits. Now the names that Beverly was given, the fake names that Beverly was given were Steve and Crystal Lewis. However, after running everything through the database, authorities got a hit on two different people, husband and wife, Aaron Lewis and Crystal Lowry. So instead of Steve Lewis, it's Aaron Lewis. And instead of Crystal Lewis, it's Crystal Lowry. Aaron Lewis was a truck driver who did have multiple petty crime charges in different states. And this is Crystal Lowry. Lewis, his wife. Now, once they had these names, authorities drove over to their home to sit outside of their house and see if Aaron would come out or anyone for that matter that matched the description that the neighbor witness had given about a white man with short hair. And not too long after authorities were sitting outside of Aaron's house, did Aaron Lewis walk out matching exactly the description that the neighbor had told police. Now, when Aaron walked out of his house, instead of police walking up to him and confronting him, authorities decided to take a different approach. They actually waited for Aaron to get into his car and drive away because they wanted to see if Aaron would lead them to wherever Beverly was. You have to remember at this point, Beverly had only been missing for about a day or two. So authorities were really hoping and holding out a lot of hope that Beverly would still be found alive. So they wanted to see if Aaron would drive to where Beverly was. Now, once once Aaron got in the car and started driving and authorities tried to discreetly follow him, their plan was foiled because Aaron figured out very quickly that he was being followed and he responded by speeding off and speeding away. However, his plan was also foiled because he ended up crashing his car and had injuries so bad that he did have to be taken to the hospital. Now, police were actually the ones that drove him to the hospital and authorities are not allowed in the examination rooms, in any of the testing rooms, when Aaron was getting MRIs or any CAT scans done, authorities can't go back there. So they have to wait in the waiting room for whoever they're waiting for to come out and talk to them. So that's exactly what they were doing. While Aaron was getting all of his testing done, authorities were waiting in the waiting room for him. However, Aaron, however he did this, was able to escape. So he ended up escaping the hospital and authorities were sitting there for hours on end waiting for him until they realized that he had escaped the hospital. Now, once authorities did figure this out, they ended up setting out a citywide manhunt for Aaron Lewis. Luckily, at this point, they knew what he looked like. They had his name. They could get a picture of him out into the media and that's exactly what happened. And this was such a big case in Arkansas at this time, especially in Scott, Arkansas. And so everyone knew about this case. And when this hit the media, everyone was looking for Aaron Lewis. We're talking normal civilians started looking for Aaron Lewis because everyone wanted to find Beverly. Now there were actually two men who worked as managers at a mortgage company. These men are named Ben Boyette and Conan Waters. And they were at their office discussing the case. And they actually knew Beverly. They had worked with Beverly before and they were at their office discussing the case and this was right after Aaron's picture got released to the media and to the public so they were discussing it and right as they were discussing it they worked in a one-story building that was located on a side street right next to a bus stop and they're talking about this case and they look outside their window and they see Aaron Lewis and they can't believe it because it's just you know one of those things where what are the odds and so one of the men actually gets up and walks out to Aaron Lewis while the other one is inside dialing 911 and the guy who approached Aaron you know he said that at first Aaron was a little bit standoffish didn't really want to talk the mortgage manager who approached him he approached him in a way where he was very very smart about this where he just kind of asked him about bus times and what time the bus was scheduled to get there so Aaron figured that he wasn't a threat and he kind of opened up to him a little bit was a little nicer and the guy said thanks so much walked back inside and was able to 100% confirm that that in fact was Aaron Lewis and authorities at this point were on their way however in the time frame between them getting there Aaron decided that he was hungry 
He wanted a little bit of a snack. So he went to a Subway sandwich shop. And at this point, that is when about five people recognized Aaron Lewis from his picture in the media and he yelled out, that's the guy and completely spooked him and he ended up sprinting across the street while five people are chasing him sprinting across the street into an apartment complex and that is when authorities pulled up however before they could catch him Aaron ran to the second story of this apartment complex into a second story apartment and jumped off the balcony. I have no idea what he thought he was going to be accomplishing by doing that. However, he had minimal injuries and he was arrested right after. Now, when authorities brought Aaron in for questioning, they sat him down and asked him where Beverly was and what he did with her. And what he said might shock you. Before we move any further, I do wanna take a second and stop and thank our sponsors for today's video. Did you guys know that 80% of the immune system is influenced by the gut? or that supporting the immune system through proper diet and digestive health enables pets to help better fight environmental allergies, Solid Gold is passionate about gut health because a healthy digestive system positively impacts the immune system and overall wellness of pets. Solid Gold was the first holistic pet food company in America, started in 1974 by Sissy McGill. You guys, Sissy was an absolute trailblazer and pioneer who disrupted a male-dominated industry and created a natural pet food before it was cool. Solid Gold's nutritional platform is inspired by their founding belief that high-quality food is the best way to impact our pet's mind, body, and spirit. I'll have you guys know, my dog recently got extremely sick and it really made me look at the ingredients and the type of food that I was giving him. I ended up switching him over to solid gold and he felt so much better. I could just tell in his overall personality. When I would give him the solid gold food, he wasn't as tired. His personality was more alive and he just seemed overall so much better. So it really had me interested in the type of products that we feed our pets and how important it is to feed them good, wholesome products. Solid Gold's foods are different because they cleanse the digestive system with whole superfoods, balance with living probiotics, and fuel with omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, supporting gut health and nourishing your pet inside and out. Right now, save 30% on Solid Gold products by going to solidgoldpet.com slash killer. That's solidgoldpet.com slash killer to save 30% on select Solid Gold products. Remember, that is just solidgoldpet.com slash killer. Now, something you should know about me is I love a good fresh start. One of my favorite activities is actually cleaning my closet and cleaning my house because I love feeling a sense of reset. And there's nothing more satisfying than hitting the reset button every once in a while. And if your hair is a little overdue for that same treatment, it's time for the Clarifying Detox Shampoo from Way. I know personally I sometimes will put way too much heat on my hair or will dry it out by washing it every day. Our hair can take a lot of experimentation and sometimes neglect, but it's never too late to hit the reset button with the Clarifying Detox Shampoo from Way. Before using the detox shampoo, my hair felt flat and like it needed a little pick-me-up and afterwards it completely revitalized my hair and brought it back to life. Use the shampoo once a week to neutralize product buildup, oil, dirt, and hard water from your hair and scalp without stripping away moisture. A combination of apple cider vinegar and keratin exfoliates and balances your scalp, plus smooths frizz and creates an incredible shine. This is great for all hair types, and Way was created by celebrity hairstylist Jen Atkin to create the first socially connected hair care brand. Explore their full collection of cruelty, sulfate, and paraben-free hair care, body, and fragrance products. And when you're ready to undo some damage, hit the reset button with the Way Detox Shampoo. Go to T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com and use the code KILLER to get 15% off your entire purchase. That's T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com code KILLER. That's the way.com code killer. All right, you guys, you guys have definitely heard me talk about BetterHelp before, and I am here to remind you about it. If you've never heard of BetterHelp before, BetterHelp is an online counseling service that provides you professional counseling in the comfort of your own 
home. Once you sign up with BetterHelp, you will then be given a short survey that will then match you with a counselor that is best deemed to fit your needs. BetterHelp has counselors that specialize in so many different areas, including anxiety, depression, grief, LGBTQ plus matters, sleeping problems, family problems, relationship problems, and more. If for whatever reason you're matched with a counselor that you don't think is the best fit, you will be able to change your counselor at any time for no additional charge. Once you connect with the counselor, you'll then be able to set up phone or video sessions and you'll also be able to text your counselor as well. Best Fiends is available worldwide and financial aid is available for those who qualify. And if you guys want to try out BetterHelp today, you can do so by going to betterhelp.com slash instinct. And when you use the code instinct, you will get 10% off your first month using BetterHelp. Again, that is just betterhelp.com slash instinct for 10% off your first month. Betterhelp.com slash instinct. Are you the type of person that as soon as you finish one true crime podcast, you're furiously scouring the internet for the next one you can sink your teeth into? Well, if you can relate, then you'll love Wondery's Generation Y podcast. In the Generation Y podcast, hosts and true crime fanatics Justin and Aaron explore hundreds of unsolved murders and conspiracy theories. They'll dig through the evidence, give their takes, and ask the hard questions. Considering everyone here already loves true crime, you are going to love the Generation Y podcast. In one of their latest episodes, Aaron and Justin profile a mysterious death from 2004. Alonzo Brooks was a young black man who went to a party with some friends, but when his friends left the party without him that night, he never returned home the next day. A month later, he was found dead without any clear indication that his death was a result of foul play, but in late July 2020, the FBI classified his manner of death to homicide. Now, what does the FBI know now? You guys, this podcast has been one of my favorites for a while now, and I love it. This case in particular has so many twists and turns, and I was hooked into it the entire time. So if you're ready to kick your true crime obsession into overdrive, subscribe to Wondery's Generation Y podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Wondery, feel the story. Now, right now, you guys are listening to a true crime podcast, so I think it's pretty safe to say that we all love a good mystery, and that's why I think you guys are going to love the game June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object murder mystery game that'll have you awakening your inner sleuth and step right into a thrilling adventure set in the heart of the roaring 20s. You will play as June Parker. June Parker is an amateur detective investigating the mysterious death of her sister. This free-to-download mobile game puts your powers of observation to the test, not to mention your memory and logic skills, leaving you refreshed and ready to tackle life's next thrill. Now, something that I really like about June's journey is that there's never a dull moment. You're never sitting there wondering what's going to happen next. You're always interacting with the game, and it's incredibly fun and challenging in the best way possible. You guys can join 30 million fans across the globe and awaken your inner detective with June's Journey. It's free to download on your phone or tablet, and you can search for hidden objects and collect clues to solve this mystery. It's endless hours of fun with thousands of intricate scenes and new chapters every week. I personally love to play this game right before I go to bed. I'm usually someone who has terrible anxiety right before I go to bed, so I like to do something that keeps my mind going a little bit, and this is perfect for that. You guys can go and download June's Journey for free today on the Apple Store or Google Play and let me know how you love it. I am so excited to hear what you guys have to say about it and how much you guys enjoy it as well, and we can all solve the mystery together. Okay, so when authorities brought Aaron in for questioning, he did admit that he kidnapped Beverly, and he said that his motive for this was money. He did not know Beverly prior to this and never met before. This was a complete stranger abduction. He said that he had Googled Beverly and saw that she was a real estate broker and figured that because of that, she would have 
money. Aaron said once he got to the house that Beverly was showing him, it was just him and Beverly. And he told Beverly once he got there that his wife would actually not be joining them for this showing. Now, after being shown the first story of this house, Beverly and Aaron then walked up the stairs together to the second story. And that is when Aaron turned to Beverly and told her, quote, you're about to have a bad day end quote. And Beverly's obviously very confused, has no idea what he's talking about. So basically asked him, you know, what are you talking about? And that is when Aaron tells Beverly, you're being kidnapped. Just take a second and imagine how you would have felt in that situation. You're in a completely empty home with this strange man who's now telling you he's going to kidnap you. Like the fear and the panic that must be running through your head is unimaginable. However, when Aaron was telling authorities all of this, he said that this was not something that he went through on his own. He did not do this on his own. He said that he did have an accomplice and it was not his wife. According to Aaron, he said that a friend of his named Trevor is actually the main person who is responsible for this and that whatever happened to Beverly, it was because of Trevor. Now, who is Trevor? You might be asking. Well, Trevor is a guy that used to live with Aaron. So he's Aaron's old roommate. And he is now the guy that Aaron is saying is mainly responsible for Beverly's disappearance. Aaron said that the last time that he saw Beverly alive, she was with Trevor. And this is also when Aaron pulls out the smoking gun to this case, which is a voice recording. Now, this is something that we do not see very often in cases that we cover. And I'm going to try and insert the voice recording. However, it might get copyrighted. So if it does, I'm not going to be able to put it in here. However, you are able to find this voice recording all over the internet. I'm going to tell you what it says as well, just in case the copyright does make me take it out. Now, this voice recording came from Aaron's cell phone and Aaron played it for authorities. And this voice recording is from Beverly. And this is what she says. She says, quote, Carl, it's Beverly. I just wanted to let you know I'm okay. I haven't been hurt. Just do what he says and don't call the police. If you call the police, it could be bad. Just want you to know I love you very much. End quote. Now again, just imagine what A, Beverly must have been feeling while making that voice recording, thinking that that might be the last time that she ever gets to speak to her family, and B, what authorities are now thinking. Because now Aaron has basically just incriminated himself. He's confessed to kidnapping Beverly, and now he has this voice recording of her. So, so he is guilty for this. And basically, authorities' next task was figuring out where Beverly was. In their mind, they were working against the clock because Aaron was not telling them whether or not Beverly was still alive whether she wasn't. So they were still working with the hope that Beverly was still alive, which to them meant that the clock was ticking and they needed to find her ASAP. So after Aaron told authorities about Trevor, he then told authorities that he would take them to the first place that he ever took Beverly and the last place that he ended up seeing her at when she was with Trevor. Now, Aaron took authorities to both of these places. They were both basically just abandoned houses. And when authorities got there, it was very clear to them that not only was Beverly not there, she was never there, meaning that Aaron was just sending police on a wild goose chase at this point. He thought that this whole thing was a game and he had the spotlight and he was going to indulge in every second of it. And not only that, when authorities started looking into who this Trevor guy was, authorities learned very quickly that there is no possible way that Trevor was ever involved in this because Trevor worked for the Air Force. And through going through the special investigations team, as well as all of Trevor's bosses that day, Day, everyone confirmed that Trevor was on base that day working. All of his supervisors said it. All of his supervisor supervisors said it. The special investigations unit said it. There is no possible way that Trevor was involved in this. Not only that, they also brought him in for several hours worth of questioning. And after that, they came to the conclusion that there is no possible way that A, Trevor did this, B, Trevor ever had Beverly, or C, Trevor had any knowledge of this whatsoever. So at this point, detective were really at a standstill. Aaron was playing them so hard and they didn't know where to turn from here. That was until authorities learned that Aaron had recently worked at a cement plant and this cement plant is called Argos. Now the lead detective on this case sat Aaron Lewis down and basically point blank asked him, mind you at this point Beverly had been missing for about four days. He point blank asked Aaron Lewis if Beverly was at the cement plant and the lead detective said that just by 
by the look on Aaron's face. He called it a stupid look on his face. The lead detective knew that that was where Beverly was. So as soon as the lead detective saw that stupid look on Aaron Lewis's face, police rushed over to the Argos cement plant. And when they started searching, that is when a police officer stumbled across a shallow grave with an elbow sticking out of it. And when they uncovered the shallow grave, that is when they found the body of Beverly Carter. Unfortunately, at this point, it was too late and she had passed away. Now, right away, Aaron Lewis was charged with the murder and kidnapping of Beverly Carter and his wife, Crystal Lowry, was charged with accomplice to murder. And there is actually a clip of Aaron being brought out to a police car after his arrest with these charges when a reporter asked him, why Beverly? And Aaron's response was, quote unquote, she was a rich broker. Now, even though Aaron pleaded not guilty to any of the charges made against him, she was a rich broker doesn't necessarily sound like the words of an innocent man. Now, once Aaron was arrested, he basically switched up his entire story. He said that Beverly was actually responsible for her own death. And the reason that he said this is because according to him, he was not meeting Beverly at this house to see a home for sale. According to Aaron Lewis, he said that the reason that he was meeting up with Beverly at this house was because this was a scheduled hookup. Aaron claimed that the two of them had agreed to hook up prior and they were just using this house as basically their spot to do it at. And Aaron said that this was essentially rough sex gone wrong. And then he decides to switch his story again because after that, he then claims that he wasn't the one that hooked up with Beverly, that it was actually his wife, Crystal that hooked up with Beverly. And again, it was rough sex that had gone wrong. And Aaron was basically being the heroic husband and defending and covering up for his wife, Crystal. However, both of these stories, mind you, they're such BS, it's mind blowing, but both of these stories completely go out the window because of that voice recording that Aaron showed authorities. That voice recording discredits basically any story that Aaron Lewis could possibly come up with. Now, this is when Aaron's wife, Crystal, comes into the picture. And after talking with her legal team, she agreed to testify against her husband, Aaron, in return for a lowered sentence of 30 years. Now, when Crystal took the stand to testify against Aaron, she claimed that this entire kidnapping operation was strictly about money. She also claimed that Aaron was the one who basically came up with this whole idea that they were going to kidnap someone for money and crystal was the one who suggested that they should look into real estate agents because real estate agents can make a lot of money and that is when they found beverly crystal went on to say that on september 24th she was in nursing school she was at a class at her nursing school when she received a text message from aaron and this text message was a picture of beverly bound up and tied in the back of Aaron's car. Crystal said that by the time that she got home, Beverly was tied up in their bathroom. And when she got home, Aaron was freaking out. Aaron was freaking out because he was so, what's the word? What's a great word for this? Because he was so stupid and realized that by the time that he got home, he forgot Beverly's credit cards. Now, why is that a problem? Because this whole thing was basically about getting Beverly's credit cards to take all of her money. And without the credit cards, they couldn't do that. So when they had Beverly in the bathroom, by the time Crystal got home, Aaron was freaking out. So he ended up leaving Crystal with Beverly while Aaron drove back to the house that he met Beverly at, that her car was still at, to go in and take her credit cards and bring them back. However, by the time that he got there, authorities had already been called. The house was already closed off as a crime scene. So he couldn't get to Beverly's car and he couldn't get to her credit cards. And what's wild is that a police officer actually stopped Aaron during, during the time of him trying to get the credit cards back. But the officer thought that Aaron was just a neighbor and lived in the area. And so was basically asking Aaron if he knew of anything that had gone on, if he had seen Beverly, not knowing that he was talking to the exact man who was responsible for all of this. And 
and Beverly was still alive at that point. Now, ultimately, this police officer let Aaron go, and Aaron basically just didn't want to deal with it anymore, so he drove back home without Beverly's credit cards because he couldn't get to them. And once Crystal and Aaron started talking about what they should do with Beverly, they figured out very quickly that because Beverly was in their bathroom, Crystal had her medication, her prescription medications, in her bathroom with her full name on it. And Beverly had seen the medications and seen Crystal's name on it and thought at that point, Beverly knew way too much and that they just had to get rid of her because there was no way that they were going to be able to let her go without her knowing exactly who they are. And this is when Crystal said that her and Aaron agreed that Beverly had to die. And that is when Aaron put Beverly in the back of his car and drove her out to the cement plant and wrapped her face in duct tape and left her there to suffocate and die. Now, in less than an hour, the jury came to a verdict and Aaron Lewis was found guilty on all counts and was sentenced to two life sentences. So he will never be released from prison and will die there. And as far as Beverly's family, they have gone on to start the Beverly Carter Foundation, which raises awareness to fund programs and training materials for real estate agent safety. So even though this is an absolute tragedy and should have never happened, it's really incredible when you see families take a situation like this and do good out of it. They start foundations and they do fundraisers and they do things that can help prevent this from happening to someone else. It's just, it's really inspiring to see. And again, this is not a typical case that we usually see. Stranger abductions are very, very, very rare. So because of that, I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this one. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime video here on my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new one. All my links are gonna be in the description box below. And I'll see you guys next week with a brand new one. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.